Hello there and welcome back to another review. So today we're going to be, well, we're down to the last three movies now, um, talking in terms of the Showa era uh, with the Godzilla movies. We're down to the last three and today we're going to be having a look at Godzilla vs. Megalon, made back in 1973 and directed by Jun Fukuda. Um, I believe this has become more one of the more well-known um, kaiju movies, especially, I think, stateside especially. Um, well, I think it's one that um, people in the States sort of remember the most, or at least when it was sort of, I think it got re released or it was at the cinema in mid 70s around i think around 76 time um and when it was quite widely widely uh, distributed and of course with home media and vhs and like later on becoming um you know the way to do like things how things happen because it's and it also has like say sort of campy um some tones with this and there's a whole lot of people who aren't into kaiju and that's how they view these movies like you know sort of a bit campy that kind of and there's nothing wrong with that i mean whoever said campy is a bad thing right a lot of people said or believed this was originally going to be um a jet jaguar solo film which i will get to in a minute about jet jaguar um sort of like the robot mech in the movie but i don't think this is the case i believe it was something to do with a contest that was held for children one of the one of the kids designed the idea for jet jaguar with um like the, that was sort of made into this movie I, I think but i think he done it the kid done it with like a different uh color scheme or something along them lines um so or it was very but a, a, a kid designed the Jet Jaguar sort of character. Apparently the Megalon suit used in this movie was one of the heaviest that had ever been made since the original Godzilla suit, which, I mean, very, which, for the performer, it meant it was very hard and heavy to lift with wires. Probably explaining why you can see a number of wires in certain shots in this movie. As probably, you know, obviously more hands and more people on set were required to get sort of the shots they needed. So because of the Jet Jaguar character, you can't help but think of Ultraman, right? You cannot help but think of because of the characters, you know, the character of Godzilla in this movie is almost playing second fiddle here. He's usually he's sort of, of on the back seat. He's sort of on the side bench. Um, he's almost, like I say, Robin to his Batman, if you will. Um, to call this film a Godzilla film, it is, I guess, but not really um godzilla is sort of sort of like godzilla is almost like a sidekick in this movie um so a lot of people say this film represents some of the low points of the movies the monsters themselves have just been being there used for comedy the barren landscapes have been like you no know, replacements for cities the back like there's the backdrop sort of when the monsters fight and there's an overuse unfortunately again of stock footage um used in each movie the film has become more aimed I've mentioned before, become more aimed at kids. Gone with the preachy messages about nuclear testing or pollution. This is very much a kids' movie, turning Godzilla into that friendly have a go hero that all kids love. But in terms of the Jet Jaguar character, you ju you just think of Ultraman. That's sort of what that's going on here. So, like with previous movies, like with sort of um, you know. Probotector Games or Fist of the North Star, they do the whole 1970X as like, you know, it's always mentioned before, it's 1990X and that kind of thing. Always an X. So we learn all this nuclear testing, the impacts of which can be felt on Monster, Monster Islands in this one again, uh, in this movie. So we learn of the nuclear testing, Godzilla and Angeris being like, wait, what the hell is that? The film starts with this guy, Goro, watching his kid brother in a lake on this like weird dolphin like pedal thing, and um, like for kids, and then this earthquake sort of happens. They manage to save the boy via the age of a rope launcher. I've always said, and this is what I'm saying, I've always said, if you're going out and your kids are like, have on their new toy or whatever in the lake having a pedal board always bring your rope launcher never leave home without it and it's just they just happen to have one laying there to save him so good thinking then the lake sort of dries up and the ground cracks open and goro jinkawa and rokuro just all stand there staring at it uh, so they go home and goro and his younger brother get smacked around as soon as they enter by some unknown thugs who just like leave afterwards after they've slapped them around a bit and roughed them up these thugs just leave. They learn the place has been like ransacked, and they have left behind this this sand like button or which are meant to be from a seabed um, seabed layer and uh, like on Easter Island. All the while, Goro has made this like Goro is like an inventor, right? He's made this like robot called Jet Jaguar, which is clearly just like an Ultraman esque type of idea. 
So after this, the younger brother gets kidnapped, and you watch this scene where he gets... When this kid gets nabbed in this car, right, the, like, the car pulls up alongside him, he gets in the car, and when you see them drive off, you it really does look like the guy's being rough with him as they drive off. I mean, it could be a doll, but you never know, but he's, like, sort of throttling him and everything like that in the car. Um, it just looks a bit too rough to me. Uh, we then learn about the people of Seatopia, where we meet this guy in, like, a toga, um, who looks like an extra from sort of Animal House or like something from the original sort of Clash of the Titans with Harry Hamlin. And basically the whole idea is that him and his people are fed up with all the nuclear testing that Earth is doing on the surface, basically. So we're back on the whole nuclear testing, nuclear, you know, that kind of thing. They awaken Megalon and want him to go forth to treat the human race a lesson. Uh, Megalon being sort of like a giant beetle. He has wings and like drill-like arms. Goro and his bro brother have been kidnapped and Jinkara has been tied up too as one of the agents from Seatopia is using Goro's control panel to sort of command Jet Jaguar at this point in the movie. So Goro and his kid brother are in like this steel container. And this is going to be dropped into one of the cracks at this lake, okay? Not sure why, like, they were sort of split up and divided. Um, like, Jinko is just tied up at Goro's, but yet yeah, Goro and Rokuro, like, the young boy, get the steel container treatment. I'm not sure why they, you know, how they dish out these punishments of who's deserving of what. But, yeah, he's just tied up. So, the story, the history is that three million years ago, this con the containment sank into the sea and their ancestors were in a bubble or something and created oxygen and an artificial sun and then created Seatopia and turns out they need robo robots to protect their people <sighs> so they, this thing sank into the sea, their ancestors were in like a, and this is actually what is said in the movie, like their ancestors were in like a bubble or something um, created oxygen and then an artificial sun and then they created Seatopia and they need like robots to protect their people or something along them lines this this one is definitely one when i say off the wall this film is off the wall okay this film is like what is going on so jin kawa breaks free and overpowers one of the guys who was keeping watch over him at goro's and after learning his friends are in a container truck he just sets off to look for him he just that's all he knows. Like, he just knows they're in a container. I mean, surely to goodness, it would have been helpful maybe to extract slightly some, a bit more information, not just they're in a freight container. Like, that's all he gets. He, he just drives off. That's all he's got, and he just drives off. Then we have, like, this car chase that leads to, like, this quarry area, and all the while, the guy from Goro's lab controls J Jaguar to leave Megalon to Tokyo so he can sort of destroy it, implying that Megalon is probably not that smart, as he needs to be, like, he has to actually have a guide, um, sort of, to lead him to his jet, like, destination, and that's the whole point of Jet Jaguar here. Um, so, yes, this is what, you know, this is what it's come to. A flying robot leading a drilling beetle-like monster to Tokyo that has been summoned by these people wearing togas. This is what's going on with the Godzilla franchise at this point. So, Hiroshi Jinkawa just so happens to find the guys who are going to dump the, can like the, can like the container with his friends inside, and they both drive off in his car. Then Megalon appears at this dam. Right, Hiroshi gets the container to drop. Megalon whacks it with his arm, calling it to sort of like get catapulted far away, and like sort of the container sort of breaks open. Now, when I was saying to you, uh, there was one review I'd done, and I said that when some some of the movies are bad, right? This is not a very you know this one is a lot. I mentioned a lot of people remember this movie if they were in the seventies. It might have been maybe some people in the late seventies, eighties might have been the first one you saw. But this one, in by and large, is not necessarily the best film. But what you get here with this dam, this dam scene, it just shows what the producers and set designers were and are capable of like, doing when they put their minds to it and they can do it really well. Like I mentioned, when miniature shots are done well, they look incredible um, because this dam set looks friggin' awesome. Like, and it's probably one, it's probably one of the best miniatures you will ever see um and you know in a godzilla movie and it's a brilliant standout scene for me because it as i say it just looks amazing not the best film in the world 
but the miniature that this damn sequence really it does look incredible attention to detail and it's just a shame that this level of care like wasn't taken in other aspects and only makes you wonder what they would have done had they had more time and money i'm not blaming the people involved but obviously obviously like i've mentioned before things like budget constraints time labor employees that kind of thing all come into fruition but here they they really made an effort with this damn sequence let's make this look good and believe you, as I say, it looks about as real as a miniature can get. Um, it really does look amazing. So they spot Jet Jaguar flying around. Turns out that Goro is like a second control system. Not sure why they don't get the military or the police to apprehend the guy who is in the house operating. Because this guy's in Goro's house, right? He's operating the control panel. Why don't they get the police or something like that, like, you know, to, who's, to apprehend this guy who's sort of controlling Jet Jaguar? Anyway, with his cool light device, Goro sends Jet Jaguar to Monster Island to fetch Godzilla, right? Because that's all, like, Jet Jaguar is. He's just fetching people or guiding people at this point. Megalon starts going a bit crazy at this point he has a, as he has no guide and loses all sense of purpose and where he is. He doesn't know what's going on because Jet Jaguar's not leading the way. Godzilla is be going, like, he begins yet another swim uh from monster island not sure why they don't just give him his own personal speedboat at this point uh because if he's on monster island all the time and he's forever just swimming back um you know to where we are where the trouble is he might as well just like i say give him like a extra large speedboat to just aid him uh then he hasn't got to just swim every time um so yeah he has to come over i mean he must be exhausted he must be absolutely exhausted when he reaches land so Jinkawa and Rakuro go back to Goro's place and use like a model plane to take out the guy there by flying it into his face. I mean, of course, that's the, I mean, that's the first idea that would come to my mind, right? You get your toy plane, you just fly it into the guy's face. Any sane person would come up with the same idea. So Seatopia, meanwhile, always, always wants help from Space Hunter Nebula, Nebula to send Gigan. They're not sure entirely why they would help this other group of people. Megalon is going crazy and torching loads of buildings. Jet Jaguar returns and turns out now he has a will of his own and he can make his own decisions. Jet Jaguar's now got free will and free thought and he can just speak, for, like, do what he wants. Okay, and we learn he can now grow to monster size. And he just randomly starts clobbering Megalon, right? Just Megalon does this whole flying around in a circle to make your opponent dizzy, shtick. I mean, okay, it's nice Jet Jaguar is having a go before Godzilla is here, but I'm I'm watching a Godzilla movie, right? This is a Godzilla movie. This is what I'm watching. I don't then you know when I say Godzilla's on the sidelines, he is on the side. He's very much just Jet Jaguar, with special guest Godzilla is really what they should have named this film. Then Gigan turns up and like. He gets like Jet Jaguar gets sort of double teamed uh, quite badly. Godzilla finally turns up, and I'll ask the first thing Jet Jaguar does is shake his hand, right? <laughs> That's the first thing they do because as I say, he's grown in size, he shakes Godzilla's hands. Godzilla at one point even grabbing a whole tree and ramming it in Megalon's face. So, all well and good, but again, we do get some stock footage, not just from old movies, but from the actual last movie with him taking on Gigan. As mentioned, the wires are very obvious in this one, so after the slight surrounding them in a ring of fire, Jet Jaguar flies him and Godzilla to safety. I mean, talk about teamwork, right? These, these two have just got it going on. Then he gets Jet Jaguar to throw Gigan in the air so he can atomic breath him whilst he is airborne. Then, of course, we have probably, along with the victory dance, along with the atomic breath flying backwards, then we have, of course, the flying foot stomp. Um, now, we have the... Now, we have the... Is that Godzilla's most over-the-top moment? Um, you no, know, we have to have, like, a pole or something, you know, because you've got the flying drop kick, the flying backwards, the victory dance. I mean, here, you know, they've jump the shark they've done everything at this point because now like i say he's got this flying foot stomp and you know and also we've had godzilla speaking to Angiris at one point you have to let me know if you what is your most outrageous silly random godzilla thing you've ever seen even if it's just like a five second moment from one of the movies but what is the most random thing you've ever seen godzilla do or a film you watched of godzilla's where you're just like what the hell um, but yeah the flying foot stomp i think everybody sort of along with the victory dance and things like that. I think a lot of people do remember that. 
So after the battle is won, our two valiant heroes have yet another gentleman's handshake and Godzilla marches off. Jack Jaguar returns to normal size and Goro sort of resumes control of him. So I'm assuming Seatopia just gave up at this point. Not really clear from their base perspective sort of what happened. Uh, the film is very much, like I've mentioned, a Jet Jaguar movie, more so than the Godzilla one. But like with all the movies, it's worth watching even just for that classic dropkick. Even just, just watch it for that, uh, really. And it's just so bonkers. You just can't... As the film goes on, you just can't help but go with the wackiness. You, I mean, if you was to watch this, like the first film and this film, back to back... Um, Two totally different movies. To two completely different movies, both in terms of narrative, plot, pacing, what happens, characters, everything like that. And sometimes with the movies, it does seem like they're just making it up as they go along, these kind of things. Like here you've got a guy who invents a robot that can fly, then that ends up can just sort of double in size. Well, not double in size, he just he grows massive. Then he gets his own, like, I, he can think for himself and things like that. You just have to go with it. And like these kind of films, you, like with the kaiju movies in general, don't think too much about them. Don't, you know, it's they're just there to be enjoyed for what they are. But I think I mentioned with Megalon, this movie, a lot of people do remember this one. Um, I, think, I think, like I say, especially stateside back in the day, I think, and it really, I think, earned its place on home video and the VHS era. But um, just two more films to go uh, from the shower era where we'll be seeing the introduction of Mecha Godzilla. So, thank you very much indeed for watching hope you enjoyed the review i'll see you again soon don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory